Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. We're your hosts, James and Anthony. This episode will be about Voldemort and analyzing evil. Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to the show. We're back to visiting the wizarding world of Harry Potter. You know, we had to figure out some more episodes to talk about it, of course. We can't resist it. Yeah, we're going to be doing way more in what Harry is this, Potter. Our, our 45th episode something, about Harry something Potter. Something like that. <laughs> something like that. But today's going to be a different one. We've never done anything like this before. We're going to do a single character spotlight, basically, on Lord Voldemort, a.k.a. Tom Marvarlo. Riddle will be analyzing evil and just talking about this character who's one of the greatest villains in fictional literature and film history who we adore so much and just talking about him and everything about him. We'll be comparing him in the books and the movies, but also talking about him more broadly of them combined together as like a single character. Also, we're bathed in your house's colors today. Green, If you're baby. watching on YouTube, we got a green set today. We're going all Slytherin. That's right. <laughs> and the thing about Voldemort, I think it's one of JK's greatest creations as a character. And I also think that even though he is often on the list of top 10, top like 25 movie villains of all time, I feel like... For those who haven't read the books, the movies never fully did him justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people maybe not understand his motivations too well. There's a lot of nuance to Voldemort and Tom Riddle. And there's so many rich layers to his life uh, from when he was born, even before he was born, that led into him becoming the Dark Lord. There's so much that informs his behavior and his views and perspectives of both Muggles and the Wizarding World. And he's just a really incredible character that J.K. created. And the if, unless you've read the books, the movies don't really translate that 100%. It's impossible to put it all in. Obviously, you want, in half the Prince, you want to see all the memories, and you want to hear learn about his family and, up, and how he was raised and all that. But, I mean, they didn't have time to put that into that movie in a two-and-a-half-hour runtime. But uh, the books really delve into the character in an amazing way. Yeah, that's why Half-Blood Prince is my favorite movie, but also my favorite book, because we learn so much about Tom Riddle and about Voldemort. We see the memories that Dumbledore has collected over the years, trying to figure out what Voldemort's plan is and to see if he's correct about his theory that the Horcruxes are his his intent and, and how he's reached immortality and going back and seeing how he acquired each of the Horcruxes, the the Goblet, the Tiara, everything, and his history with Hogwarts, his history with leaving Hogwarts, coming back, the conversations in the meeting. I think the meeting he has with Dumbledore at Hogwarts where yeah. he, he plants, uh, he, he tries to say he's getting he's there for a job, yeah. but he's not really there, but in, in stuff like that. So I think learning so much more about his past, learning about the Gaunts, which we don't get close to in the movies. And really, when it comes to the movies, Dumbledore is really only showcased at the end of Goblet of Fire, at the end You mean of, Voldemort? I mean, sorry, I mean, uh -huh. yeah. Voldemort's only showcased at the end of Goblet of Fire, end of Order of the Phoenix, pretty decently in Half-Blood Prince, mm -hmm. and obviously- Not definitely. present Voldemort, yeah. though. But obviously all over, we have some shots of him in Armani suits in Half-Blood <laughs> Prince. Yeah, hallucinations of him just cracking his neck. <laughs> but also, and then Deathly Hallows, obviously, he's all over. But in in even the Sorceress, don't we only get very brief glimpses of him? He's only in the final scene, really, of dialogue speaking to Harry in the back of Quirrell's head. He's not really present in Chamber of Secrets outside of his persona as Tom Riddle. This is the memory. And then uh, Prisoner of Azkaban. I don't, there's really Not, nothing no. to do with Voldemort in that at all. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. <laughs> but that's what's one of the best things about the character because uh, what's interesting is JK didn't really know what she was doing with the character. All she knew was that she wrote this idea of a boy who's killed by of Harry Potter's. He's killed by the greatest evil wizard in hundreds and hundreds of years. And then she didn't have his backstory planned with even in the even in the first book and even in the second book. So she was basically she had this concept. And the starting point was at Harry's attempted murder. And then she, as she was writing the novel, she was figuring out Tom Riddle and Voldemort's backstory, which is a really interesting way to approach the character. Rather. Although, I'm sorry, didn't she write the ending too, as well as the beginning? She wrote, she wrote, she didn't write the ending. Ending, she wrote like, obviously he defeats him or something like that. And nothing very specific, but I'm talking about like uh, the character. Obviously you can write an ending where Vo Harry kills Voldemort in the end, but I'm talking like who the character is, what his life was like, what led him to these to, to these parts of the story and it was probably the best way to rather than just being like i need to flesh out the character before i even start writing the first book 
It's not completely necessary. Just knowing, and that's one of the strengths of Voldemort is in many of the books, you don't, you just know of him, especially the first one. You, you just hear these rumors of him and just the reactions that the wizards have when Harry is meeting many people for the first time and entering the world. Their reactions to talking about he who must not be named and then Hagrid's scared to death to even say his name. These things elicit fear in the audience, and we're afraid of this character before we've even met them by the end of the book. Yeah, the lack of Voldemort is one of the greatest strengths yeah. of the character, and the mystery and intrigue, and just like Anthony just said, hearing all the horrible things that he's done, how no one will speak his name because they're all afraid of him. It's actually ended up being one of the greatest parts and what made Voldemort so terrifying, because if he was, if he was the main antagonist and From main the villain, get-go. in every yeah. single book, it'd be like, oh, it's Voldemort again, oh, go. Voldemort again, yeah, here, here we, we go. go. But now he's really not the villain and in, in half of them if you think about it yeah, technically exactly he yeah. just shows up here and there as he's regaining strength regaining figuring out a way to Hitting get his gym. body <laughs> failing failing to get the sorcerer's stone but then figuring out the spell and the goblet of fire to be restored which is so cool and everything now voldemort let's do a little background on him about where he's from where he came from How what's his what are his signs what are his signs fill, fill us in <laughs> his signs <laughs> well, uh, he's a december baby he's a gemini <laughs> <laughs> tom marvolo riddle was born on december 31st 1926 he actually died in 1998 in May, so he was, what, 72 years R. old? R.I.P. <laughs> <laughs> Almost 72 years old. <laughs> Later known as Lord Voldemort, or alternatively, as you know who, the Dark Lord, or he who must not be named, was an English half-blood wizard considered to have been the most powerful and dangerous wizard of all time. He was amongst the greatest wizards to have ever lived, often considered more powerful or equal to Albus Dumbledore, the only child and son of Tom and Marope Riddle, Riddle was raised as in the Muggle Run Wolves Orphanage after his father abandoned his new family on the streets of London when the influence of her magic was lifted. And his mother died moments after giving birth to and naming him after his father and maternal grandfather, Marvel Logan. Riddle began attending Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry in 1938 and was sorted into Slytherin House. Some of his early activities included the opening of Salazar Slytherin's Chamber of Secrets and the use of activities. its monster. <laughs> Just really casual stuff, guys. <laughs> also, we're using Harry Potter fandom for a bunch of information today. Uh, the Basilisk to attack Muggleborn students, which resulted in Myrtle Warren's death. Several months service as a purchasing agent for dark artifact shop Borgen and Burks. That's where he got that information. He, uh, he, it was his summer on job. The Horcruxes. Yeah, just it's summer a, job. <laughs> most, it kids, was. most kids sell ice cream cones. <laughs> Voldemort's working at Borgen and Burks. He chose to work there. He has the ability to speak Parseltongue and the attainment of immortality between the years of 1943 and 1998, a process begun upon the creation of his first Horcrux at the age of 16, which was, I believe, the diary. Yeah. He was made a prefect in 1942. The ring, ring was the first. The ring. Was it the ring or the diary? Maybe. I'll, I'll figure yeah. out. I have the list right here. Uh, he was made prefect and won many awards while at Hogwarts at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft witchcraft in wizardry splitting his spirit into a total of eight fragments riddle created an unprecedented seven horcruxes one unintentionally and without his knowledge harry potter because the seventh one was just going to be him, him. but yeah. then he actually made seven, seven pieces extra of soul. yeah horcrux so there are technically eight pieces yeah. of voldemort's soul out there uh abandoning his muggle name he became the first self he became the self-proclaimed Lord Voldemort, which was an anagram of his birth name. He commanded a veritable army of wizards and dark creatures, committed countless murders and atrocities personally and through his followers. And on one occasion, nearly succeeded on a later occasion, did succeed in taking over the Ministry of Magic, installing a puppet minister, plus Thickenese, who was controlled with the Imperious Curtain. <laughs> P.S. Not plus. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's an I with a dot. Pious Thickenies. Pious, right? thank yeah. you. Oh, my screen was not that bright. <laughs> Pious Thickenies. Plus, <laughs> plus, plus size Thickenies. <laughs> Paramount plus Thickenies. <laughs> Voldemort was ripped from his body in 1981 after attempting to kill Harry Potter. Although unable to die, he was not able to regain a permanent and physical body until 1995, thus spending the intervening 14 years as a shell less than the meanest ghost, but alive. He was finally killed by his own backfiring curse after Albus Dumbledore and Harry Potter, following Dumbledore's death, succeeded in destroying all of his horcruxes. And also, just a really quick fun fact, unknown to most, 
However, Voldemort's legacy and bloodline would live on through his daughter Delphine, whom he conceived with his loyal follower Bell Bellatrix Lestrange sometime after the Battle of the Department of Ministries in 1996 and before Voldemort's death at the hands of Harry in 1998. And Delphine is actually a main character in The Cursed Child. Is that in the original series? Cursed Child. No, no, yeah, is but it, is, yeah. is it mentioned at all? I believe. I don't think so. It's in the play. Is in the play? Yeah. Interesting. I did not know that he had a kid. And then Harry, I mean, really, Bellatrix would be his baby mama. Yeah. That would be, a, they should have gone that direction rather than what they did with Fantastic Yeah, that's Beats. really interesting. And Riddle's broken and mutilated soul was then trapped in limbo for eternity, unable to move into the afterlife or even return as a disembodied spirit. Yeah, so for, for anyone who was wondering what happened to Voldemort after Harry took him out, uh, yeah, he's just uh, that little shriveled up corpse for the, for all eternity. All eternity. In, in pain and agony. Can never escape. Time. So that's a true hell that he locked himself in. What we should start with, I think, is probably Voldemort's fear of death. I think it's his most defining characteristic. Actually, I think we should just take a moment real quick because before <laughs> we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast besides using our coupon codes is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast where you get awesome perks like podcast schedules, personalized videos, and Patreon shouts in the show weekly bonus episodes that every single patron has access to as well as ten dollar twenty five dollar tier and one hundred dollar tier patrons have access to our discord where we interact with you every day we have our watch parties on there as well twenty five dollar and one hundred dollar tier patrons get their own custom personalized episode you pick the topic and we do it for you one hundred dollar tier patrons are also get an executive producer credit on the main episodes of the show at the end of every main episode as well as they get a personalized watch party which and is very cool they also get to have a guest appearance on the show on their third oh, yeah. month. Third month of that Chosen One patronage, you get to have a guest segment on here, which we've is super had, we've cool. We've had two guests so far. Uh, we also launched our Podcast Masterclass online course, so for anyone who wants to start a podcast or improve their current podcast, our 22 chapter 46 video lesson course will give you all of the secrets behind the scenes of our show. The link is podcastmasterclass.teachable.com or it's right on our homepage of our website, raidersofthelostpodcast.com. It's right there. Thanks so much for tuning in around the world. Follow, subscribe, wherever you're listening. Leave those five-star reviews. And let's get back into Voldemort because we are just getting started. So something you said um, from the fandom when you said that when you mentioned that he worked at Borgen and Burks, that I, it's really interesting that uh, so Tom, when he was a kid, when he was a teenager, he chose to work at Borgen and Burks uh, and other wizards, especially teachers and te uh, wizards who knew him around town. They found that to be odd because he was so intelligent and so capable as a student that he would work at that store, they found that we, he could have had a, a much better job. It's actually where he went to work after he graduated. After graduating, I'm sorry. I mean, after graduating, they were like, why is he working he was at- head boy, yeah. prefect, yeah. top marks. They were like, why is he working at Borgen and Burks? It makes no sense. And like, he was like the top kid of his class in Hogwarts. But he chose to work there because he wanted to learn about these ancient artifacts uh, having to do with the, you know, darkness and, and death. And that- leads into his ultimate fear of death because ever since a ch he was a child he's been planning and he's he's been wanting to be immortal since he was, you could say he was a kid uh, and even when he was a teenager in, in at hogwarts he began planning a way of making himself immortal of escaping death and it is a really great ironic tra trait of voldemort who claims to be the most powerful and greatest wizard of all time, but nobody fears death more than he does. And that's and he, he brags about himself being immortal, but he made himself immortal out of fear. For someone who's, who says he's the strongest, most evil person alive, he has more fear than probably anyone. Uh, and he also, the irony is that he says death is, he, he J.K. Rowling said that Voldemort called death uh, a human weakness. And he doesn't look at himself as human, even though he's a half-blood, which is another great irony of Voldemort. And so this fear of death makes no sense because he himself is human, and yet he's calling it a human weakness. And everything Voldemort did was a way of escaping death. Yeah, he has a lot of fears and insecurities, actually. You could argue that his biggest fear is actually also, besides death, his second biggest fear could be Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. He's terrified of Harry Potter because he can't kill Harry he Potter. He wouldn't even touch him after the the uh, for, hidden the forest attack. Exactly, yeah. and if you think about it, Order of the Phoenix, that whole plot, his objective in the Order of the Phoenix, Voldemort, is to 
have Harry get the the prophecy so that Voldemort can hear the entire the prophecy in its entirety. All he ever heard was a partial prophecy from what Snape recounted from him after Severus Snape was eavesdropping on Dumbledore and Trelawney's meeting. So Voldemort never understood or heard the full prophecy. The entire objective of Order of the Phoenix in that film in that book is he's trying to obtain it. Whereas if he just wanted to kill Harry Potter, he could have just killed him right there. But he wants Harry to obtain the prophecy because he's afraid of Harry. He wants to hear it in its entirety because, like, what else was in that thing that that prevents me from killing this kid? So you can think that you could say that his second biggest weakness is Harry Potter. Well, I mean, his it, biggest fear. Fear. Sorry. The, well, the thing about the prophecy is it's extremely ironic because Dumbledore even said that if if Voldemort hearing the prophecy, if he had never heard the prophecy, none of this would have happened, and he would have probably maybe taken over and ruled as Dark Lord for indefinitely because once he heard the prophecy, then he decided he, he's going to attack this boy's home and kill this boy. So if he had never heard the prophecy, if Snape never eavesdropped on Trelawney and Dumbledore and never and never spread that news to Voldemort, he would have never attacked Harry Potter. He would have never known of a prophecy, and he would have just kept continuing his reign of mayhem. Everything happened because of his knowledge of the prophecy so the prophecy itself was like kind of like a grandfather paradox in a way where of inevitability yeah yeah, like if he had he heard it and so he he made it happen because he heard it although the prophecy doesn't say that he will be defeated it just says so actually let's read the prophecy so this is Sybil Trelawney's first prophecy the one with the power to vanquish the Dark Lord approaches, born to those who have thrice defied him, born as the seventh month dies. And the, and the Dark Lord will mark him as his equal, but he will have power the Dark Lord knows not. And neither must die at the end of the other, or neither can live while the other survives. The one with the power to vanquish the Dark Lord will be born as the seventh month dies. <laughs> <laughs> now, the prophecy was made while Trelawney was having an interview with Dumbledore for the post of divination teacher at Hogwarts school Dumbledore who was disappointed at the performance of the of the interview she was having <laughs> was about to leave when she went into a trance and made an actual prophecy during the prophecy Trelawney specified that the requirements for the boy of the prophecy who was capable of but not necessarily would be defeating the Dark Lord they were the following it was a boy he was born in the closing days of July of 1980 the year the prophecy was made so that would be July 31st his parents had defied Voldemort three times and lived to tell about it and he would have the power, obviously, to be able to defeat Voldemort with p- power that Voldemort didn't understand. Now, Severus Snape, who at the time was working for Voldemort, was caught eavesdropping on Trelawney and Dumbledore by the owner of the Hogshead and was subsequently thrown out of the pub. Snape then returned to Voldem- Voldemort to tell him just what he heard. Now, this prophecy pointed out two children. It pointed out Harry Potter and Neville Longbottom. Both had the same birthday. Both had parents who defied the Dark Lord. All four were members of the Order of the Phoenix. So why instead did Voldemort choose Harry over Neville? He did because Harry is half-blood. So he saw himself in Harry Potter, and that's why he chose Harry, is because he was a half-blood like himself, even though he would never admit that he was a half-blood. Yeah, Neville's a pure-blood. Mm-hmm. And... The power that he that the Dark Lord would not understand was the power of love, and now love. that's a whole that's that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Let's get into that a little bit because we have a there's a ton to talk about with love. And now there's a, well there's actually a second prophecy while mm. we're on the topic. Let's go. Yeah. So this is the second prophecy from Trelawney. This happens to Harry Potter. Um, so during Sybil's second prophecy, which goes like this, it will happen tonight. <laughs> the Dark Lord lies alone and friendless, abandoned by his followers. His servant has been chained these 12 years. Tonight, before midnight, the servant will break free and set out to rejoin his master. The Dark Lord will rise again with the servant's aid, greater and more terrible than he ever was. Tonight, before midnight, the servant will set out to rejoin his master. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, dear boy. <laughs> dear boy. <laughs> this, pre- this prophecy was made on June 6, 1994 to Harry Potter in the movie. He comes back Ask with the, yeah. with, in, with the, the, um, the, the orb. orb. It's Goblet of Fire, isn't it? No, it's Azkaban. No, it's Goblet. Gobble- she makes the prophecy in her office after... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you're yeah. right. <laughs> after divination class. <laughs> her mind pushes yeah, the orb Yeah, over. she's using the... Sorry. Yeah, you're time right. turner. You're right. It's okay. Anyways... 
Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You're right. It's Prisoner of Azkaban because Pizza <laughs> Pizza Pettigrew. Pizza Pettigrew. Pizza Pettigrew. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Sorry, I had a brain fart for a moment. But so the fear of death is um, a main contrast of Harry and Voldemort. So Harry and Voldemort. What's really great when you have when you're writing a story and you have two characters, one being an antagonist, one being a protagonist, is excellent when their perspectives and viewpoints and their motivations are complete polar opposites. So Harry and Voldemort are complete opposites. Where Harry, where Voldemort fears death and will do anything to escape it, Harry is extremely selfless and is willing to sacrifice himself to save the ones he loves without question, without hesitation. He's he's willing to sacrifice himself many times, and that's something that really sets him apart from Voldemort, them being completely contrasting opposites. It's another thing that Voldemort does not understand how he can even love other people because Voldemort has no interest in loving anyone else. So the fear of death is something that completely um, separates Voldemort from Harry. And it's one of Harry's greatest strengths against him because obviously we all know Harry uses this willingness to sacrifice himself to eliminate the final Horcrux within him. Now, Harry and Voldemort also have similarities. Number Many, one yeah. being they're both half-blood. Harry Potter wears this badge proudly, whereas Voldemort hides it immensely from everybody, from all of his followers. He hates half-bloods. He... He only wants a world of pure blood wizards. Ironically, he is a half blood, and yeah. he he shunned his his Muggle family's name. He killed his Muggle family in his past, and so he's just abandoned that altogether. Dumbledore and, he, and Harry are the only ones who know he's a half blood because much. he killed his family, so both, no one would ever find out. Both Harry and Voldemort are also orphaned children who grew up with their parents, and both were actually raised by Muggles, which shaped who would they be, who they would become. Both are exceptionally powerful. Voldemort, obviously, a little more powerful than yeah. Harry. <laughs> Both Harry's talented. <laughs> he's, he's, he gives his dad. There's a reason money. why. There's a reason why Harry outdueled him at the end. We'll yeah, get yeah. to that. Yeah. <laughs> both consider Hogwarts to be their homes, despite growing up in an orphanage and Harry growing up with the Dursleys. Both consider Hogwarts to be their true homes, especially in their adolescence and youth. Yeah, and for Voldemort, I'm sorry to interrupt. It's but cool, man. You can interrupt me anytime to interject. Uh, that's it, violent. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> Let me interject. I'm, inter I'm interjecting. <laughs> uh, Hogwarts is so important and so special to Voldemort. It's actually the motivation for him framing Hagrid in Chamber of Secrets because if they close down the school, he would be sent back to the orphanage for probably indefinitely if Hogwarts never opened again. So he framed Hagrid as the opener of the Chamber of Secrets so that he could keep Hogwarts open. And also, we all know he, he hid one of his Horcruxes Rowena Ravenclaw's diadem inside the Room of Acquirement inside of Hogwarts because Hogwarts is such a special place to him. Next up, they both shared Phoenix Core wands. Yes. So when Tom Riddle was little 12-year-old Tom, he went to Ollivander's to get his I wand. I wonder. He got that wand, and that wand shares the same core from the same Phoenix feather. That's going to be, I mean, in the entire series, is, is that the best moment of the series? Which part? When Harry gets his the wand. Because the buildup with Ollivander and John Hurt just, he performs that scene so well. And it's the buildup. He's trying out these other wands and it's creating mayhem. And then, nope, nope, definitely, definitely not. not. Nope. <laughs> and then he's like, he looks to the way to himself. He's like, I wonder. It's great. Curious. Curious. And then he pulls out the wand very carefully, opens the box. And he's like extra delicate with this wand because he knows this core was also in another one and then he hands it to harry and then the light comes up john williams score starts playing when the wind plays and then we get a, a slow pushing on him it's a really magnificent moment for the entire series i think it could be the best moment of the entire series it's really beautiful and then we get the aftermath the resolution of olivander describing whose wand that is and the it's sis, its brother gave you that scar. <laughs> Amazing moment. I it, remember every wand I ever <laughs> sold, Mr. Potter. Yeah, I think it's in incredible. You know what's interesting? Do you think that every time Ollivander sells a wand to a kid, <laughs> that, that, that happens? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you think the lights come up, the wind? He's probably constantly dusting yeah, that, that freaking place. That thing, but that place must be. He's like, here mess. we go again. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing this job anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's actually maybe it's just a very powerful wand. Yeah, no, it's just. A and also, it's be fucking Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, if you guys aren't sure yet, we're going 
books and film heavy. Together. This is not just going to be movie centric. So we, we brought that we're up. Gonna, don't you we're going to dive in, but that's, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> More similarities bef- between Harry and Thomas Marvel. Actually, it's just Tom. Um, they were technically both descended from the Peverils. Yeah. So both have very ancient magical blood. They're like distant, distant cousins. Very, very, very distant. So they're technically related because Salazar Slytherin, who is the founder of Slytherin, he is a relative of the Peverils, just like Harry Potter yeah. is. Yeah. And pe- the Gaunts, the Gaunts defend, descend from Slytherin, and then the Riddle and Tom Riddle. Voldemort descends from the Riddles and the Gaunts. So, yeah. So that's a different similarity as well. They're also natural leaders, and even though. Voldemort is more evil, of course. Harry is still a natural leader as well. And also, they both were technically suited for Slytherin. Mm-hmm. The Sorting Hat wanted to put Harry into Slytherin. You could obviously say that that's because, because of, of the, imprint. the imprints, but yeah. maybe it wasn't. Maybe, I, maybe it's not. I say that it's because of the piece of Voldemort within him. Because he has the, the Salazar Slytherin qualities. He wasn't born with the ability to, to speak parcel tongue. That's something that was imprinted onto him through Voldemort. So I think that Voldemort obviously gave Harry some of his power because of the piece of the soul within him. And so I think that's why the Sorting Hat saw him having a future in Slytherin. I think that if Harry had lived the normal life with his parents, he would have been a shoo-in for, for Gryffindor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Sorting Hat wouldn't have thought twice about it. He would have like said Gryffindor before his hat, hat got put on his yeah, head, just like Draco, Draco with Slytherin. Yeah. So I think that the imprint of, of Voldemort's soul influenced Sorting Hat because that could have corrupted him. And if if Harry was weaker in character, and like we said in other episodes, if he was raised differently, if he was if he was if he wasn't modest, if he wasn't humble, if he wasn't selfless, all of that dark influence would have grown within him and he would have become a dark wizard. Absolutely. Now how about some differences between them? Obviously Anthony brought up the difference into the the perspective on death, how Voldemort's greatest fear is death, whereas Harry accepts friend death like an old friend. <laughs> he accepts death like an old friend and on oh, the ex- biggest I'm sorry, the biggest difference is the nose. Oh, the nose. We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> and also, another major difference is power. Voldemort, all he seeks besides uh, cure to death is more power, more strength, larger army, more minions, more power, more powerful magic. Whereas Harry t- per- pushes power he away. He rejects power. He rejects the Elder Wand. He snaps it in half in the movie. And he uses it to just fix his wand in the book so he rejects the other one in both source in both pieces of material he's maximus and gladiator basically <laughs> commodus is not the moral man <laughs> so yeah harry's rejection of power again is another polar opposite to voldemort who all he wants is power the next polar opposite is friendship you know harry tells him at the order of the Fe- in, at the order of the phoenix after he's trying to possess him that you'll never know friendship or love and this the way that harry's able to beat that possession is thinking of his friends, thinking of his family, thinking about Hogwarts, everything that makes him happy and the love he feels for them. Voldemort grew up and when he was forming his Death Eaters, you know, they were, he would tell them he, they're his friends. But So the Death Eaters over time really gathered himself, this gang of Slytherin thugs, motley composition of the weak seeking protection, the ambitious seeking some shared glory, and the thuggish gravitating toward a leader who could show them more refined forms of cruelty, most of which would become the first Death Eaters. Riddle claimed they were his friends and made it appear so in public, but in truth, they amounted to little more than servants to him, and he cared almost nothing for them. He often manipulated them into committing petty crimes and other misdeeds, but none of these incidents were really traced back to the group, so he used them. He never had friends. Death Eaters are not his friends. And ironically, many of the parents of the characters we know from Harry's story were part of this gang with Tom Riddle, the Crab, Goyle, and um, a Malfoy, just like Harry. He, they're they, those, the parents of those kids went to school with Tom, and they were part of his Death Eater crew. However, in Order of the Phoenix, it goes a little bit differently uh, when when Voldemort is trying to possess Harry's mind. Uh, Harry's intense love for Sirius and the and horrible grief and pain he feels for Sirius's death is what kicks Voldemort out of his mind. Voldemort cannot bear to feel the grief that Harry feels uh, for Sirius in that moment. And that's what makes Voldemort be like, I gotta get out of this brain. Voldemort can't bear that because he doesn't love anyone. He doesn't know what real loss is. And so when he feels what Harry's feeling, that's what makes him be like, I gotta get out of this head. Another difference between Voldemort and Harry is Harry, all he wants to do once he gets to the Wizarding World and finds out that 
he is the most famous person alive. All he wants is to be ordinary. He just wants to fit in. He never, and he was the exact polar opposite when he was in the muggle world with the Dursleys. He was below normal. Like people treated him like a sock on the floor, whether it was people at school, his cousin, because of the, because of his cousin. Then also he had no friends and his aunt and uncle treated him like nothing below, like a lower class human being or lower class citizen. Whereas Voldemort, and then when Harry's in the Wizarding World, he just wants to be Harry. I'm just, just, just Harry. Harry. He just wants to be normal. He just wants a family. Whereas Voldemort, he just wants kids. <laughs> <laughs> whereas Voldemort, all he wants is to be extraordinary and famous and feared. And he chose his name, Lord Voldemort, and he wants people to not to fear him so much they can't even say his name. He he must not be named the Dark Lord. He wants infamy, and that's all he cares about is to be extraordinary and to rule. And what's interesting about the name change, because Voldemort, it's not really touched on in the movies too much, but Voldemort hates being called Tom. It, it drives him nuts. And that's why he, he refers to, he changed his name basically to Voldemort, Lord Voldemort, the Dark Lord. And nobody calls him Tom Riddle except for Harry and Dumbledore. Uh, Tom, he, Voldemort hates the name Tom. And I think that the true hatred he has for Muggles because it is completely unwavering. And it is extreme, where he wants to just rule over muggles. I think that that really stemmed from his father abandoning his mother while she was pregnant with him. And knowing that he was abandoned by his muggle father made him hate muggles even more. Because, and also, you could also say that if, if uh, Merop never died and raised Tom, you know, decently, he wouldn't have become, obviously, the, the evil man he did become. But I think that... Uh, Tom Riddle, the, the father, abandoning his son while his, his wife was pregnant is really what made Voldemort hate muggles beyond reason. And then he hated muggles so much that when he found out that he was part muggle, he cut that part out of him. He murdered his father and he murdered his grandparents, the Riddles. And nobody ever knew. Nobody, he never let anyone know that he was part muggle. I think that that hatred for Muggles comes from the abandonment of his father. Yes, but it's also a little more complex where he believed that his father abandoned his mother because he found out that she was a witch where yes, what actually yes, yes. happened yeah. was obviously we'll get into where Marope was using a love potion on Muggle Tom Riddle mm -hmm. to make him fall in love with her artificially, which is one of the reasons why Voldemort cannot feel love. And she hoped that if she stopped using the love potion, that he would fall in love with her regardless of the love potion. But as soon as he was broken out of the spell, he ran. Yeah. So Voldemort thought he ran because he found out she was a witch, whereas he just he left, which is obviously a horrible thing to do to leave a pregnant your yeah. pregnant wife. Or you and but he left because he was kicked out he, of the he, love potion. He said he was hoodwinked into now, uh, marrying a woman. Yeah. Now to quote, so I think it's also tied to the, obviously like you said the abandonment that yeah. you're talking about. To quote Voldemort from the books. You see, it was a name I was already using at Hogwarts to my most intimate friends only, Lord Voldemort. Of course. You think I was going to use my filthy muggle father's name forever? I, in whose veins runs the blood of Salazar Slytherin himself. Through my mother's side, I keep the name a foul. I keep the name of a foul, common muggle who abandoned me even before I was born just because he found out his wife was a witch. Wrong. So he was mistaken there. Mm -hmm. No, Harry, I fashioned myself a new name, a name I knew wizards everywhere would one day fear to speak when I become the greatest sorcerer in the world. Albus Dumbledore is the greatest sorcerer <laughs> in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Albus Dumbledore, Dumbledore has been driven out by the mere name Ma of me. <laughs> the mere like... memory of me. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and also what's really fascinating is the creation of the name Voldemort. Obviously, it hinges on his middle name, Marvalo. Uh, which he is proud of. He's proud of the name Marvalo, his grandfather, Marvalo Gaunt. Now, the Gaunt's history is really fascinating, and it's some, it's a side to Voldemort that he's proud of because the Gaunts, they, are, they were the last descendants of Salazar Slytherin, the last known descendants. However, it really feeds into what kind of person Voldemort was. Uh, the Gaunts, through basically inbreeding of cousin marriages because they were extremely strict about having pure blood in their family. They were susceptible to um, mental illness and extreme bouts of violence within the personalities of the members of the Gaunt family. And that's very well showcased in the Gaunt uh, family history during Half-Blood Prince where we learn the backstory of um, uh, 
Marvalo and his two kids, Marope and Morphin. Marope being Tom's mother. Marope had a huge crush on Tom Riddle, who was a neighbor. The Riddles were neighbors of theirs, of the Gaunts in the in the uh, in that town. And she had a crush on Tom Riddle, and her brother Morphin hated that, and so he hexed Tom Riddle. And as a way of investigating what happened of wizards using magic on a muggle, a uh, ministry official came to question the Gaunts, and the Gaunts attacked him because they are just they were vicious, violent wizards. This caused both Morphin and uh, Marvalo to be arrested and locked up in Azkaban. When uh, Marvalo was eventually released, he died shortly after from complications of poor health um, and old age. And then Morphin, when he returned not long after that, Tom Riddle, the teenager, showed up, killed his grandparents and his father, killed uh, Morphin, and then framed Morphin as the murderer of his parents. And also, Murrow, after oh, no, her... he didn't kill Morphin. He, oh, um... Oh, Morphin got locked up. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. so he impure... He, he um, imp 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 yeah. Messed up his yeah, mind. Yeah, obliviated yeah, Obliviated, yeah. I'm sorry. He get, Mor Morphin got arrested for the murder of the Riddles. I'm sorry. And then Dumbledore tried to um, show the memory to the Azkaban officials, but uh, Marvalo died... Morphin died right before he could show the evidence of the memory. And then for Marope, after her father and brother were sent to Azkaban, she was alone. That's when she gave Tom Riddle the love potion. They got married. had a, uh, She was pregnant. And then she was like, you know what? Maybe he does really love me. It's unethical for me to keep using the love potion on him. I think that he really loves me. When he was off the potion, he's like, what the hell is going on? Bounced. And then Marope kind of like wandered around by herself for a long time. She was struggling with health, made it into that orphanage, gave birth to Tom, and then died an hour later. You can argue from a broken heart as exactly, well. Exactly, yeah. She like ha lost her will to yeah, live. Completely. And at the Gaunt Shack, after the murders in the framing of Morphin, this is where Tom took the Gaunt family's signet ring from Morphin, and later he would use to put another part of his soul in to make his second Horcrux. So the diary was first, second Horcrux was the ring, and he often wore it like a trophy at Hogwarts. Yeah, and what's I love Voldemort's fascination with... Um, historical objects of meaning and value. And that's why he worked at Borgen yeah, and Burks. that's why he worked at Borgen and Burks. He wanted to learn as much as he could, and there's a couple of memories, especially when how he gets Helga Hufflepuff's uh, cup. Uh, the goblet is from that old woman who is who has it, and she he killed her to get that. Charmed her. The, charmed her, yeah. First, charmed <laughs> yeah, her. Yeah, charmed the hell out of her. <laughs> because ironically, Tom, before he was tearing his soul apart too many times, which deformed him, he was very handsome, and he was very charming. Uh, he had beautiful slick black hair pale skin high cheek bones. high cheekbones the ladies good, loved him good looking guy the ladies loved him but clearly, not, and I rock, Anthony yeah. did you're sweating you're like oh that, that, <laughs> Tom, those high cheek Tom Riddle man <laughs> tight skin <laughs> and ironically he tore his tearing his soul apart just destroyed his physical his physical body and then he became a monster but I love the idea of him he loves power and because of that love for power, he loves powerful wizards. Powerful wizards through history. Why not make Horcruxes from items belonging to the powerful wizards who created Hogwarts? So you have the most powerful wizards in history, creators of Hogwarts combined into one super thing. He was just like inundated with that idea of like, if I can get an object from each one of these founders, that would be just my, that would feed my craving for power in this collection that I want. Yeah, and so he made seven Horcruxes. Technically, only made six. He was the seventh one. Accidentally made Harry Potter as the seventh additional Horcrux. What a bonehead. Since you touched on the design of or what uh, Voldemort ended up looking like, how about we talk about the design? Let's talk of about this it, man. Dark Lord. <laughs> so the book first film is a little different. Half-Blood Prince is a great book because we get to see the gradual progression of of Voldemort as he turns more and more into the monster that he becomes presumably becoming more snake-like and soulless with every kill and horcrux he makes, but really taking on the look and aesthetic of a snake after he is restored. So this is from chapter 20 in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. So this is during... Oh, no, no, this is Harry Potter and the, ha the Half-Blood Prince, Chapter 20, Voldemort's Request. So, this is when Voldemort comes back to Hogwarts to have a fake meeting with Dumbledore. H this is Harry's perspective. His features were not those Harry had seen emerge from the Great Stone Cauldron almost two years ago. They were not as snake-like. The eyes were not yet scarlet, the face not yet mask-like, and yet he was no longer handsome Tom Riddle. 
It was as though his features had been burned and blurred, like they were waxed and oddly distorted, and the whites of the eyes now had permanently bloody look. Though the pupils were not yet the slits that Harry knew they would become, he was wearing a long black cloak, and his face was as pale as the snow glistening on his shoulders, so he still looked a little human. He probably had some hair or something too, but he was, But it was the restoration where he became snake-like, especially. And young Tumber, like Anthony said, was very handsome like his father. He looked awfully like that 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 wealthy muggle from over there. Uh, also, the meeting, or then the restoration of his body. So in Goblet of Fire, the book and movie, Voldemort's body is restored, giving him a snake-like appearance with slits instead of a nose, red reptilian eyes, and extremely pale skin. However, in the movies, what I think they did effectively and cleverly was they actually kept Ray Fiennes' normal human eyes, which actually makes it a little more creepier because it adds a little humanity to this monster. It makes the audience connect to, to him. If they were glowing red eyes, it would be too monstrous. Now, the return of Lord Voldemort took place on June 24th, 1955, in the graveyard of Little Hangington, which is the graveyard that his family was buried in his father. While in the graveyard, Lord Voldemort was restored to physical form with full magical power. He was restored after being incorporated for nearly 14 years. Um, also, the rebirth was a result of months of meticulous planning by Voldemort and his servants, Peter Pettigrew, Bartimius, Bartimius Crouch Jr., Body Crouch Jr., Junior who manipulated the Triwars of Tournament being held at Hogwarts the year in order to deliver Harry Potter to Voldemort. So this is a quote from Goblet of Fire, Chapter 32, Flesh, Bone, and Bone. Flesh, Blood, and Bone. But then, through the mist in front of him, he saw, with an icy surge of terror, the dark outline of a man, tall and skeletally thin, rising slowly from inside the cauldron. Rob me, said the high, called the voice from behind the steam, and Wormtail, sobbing and moaning, still cradling, cradling his mutilated arm, scrambled to pick up the black robes from the ground, got to his feet, reached up, and pulled them one-handed over his master's head. The thin man stepped out of the cauldron, staring at Harry, and Harry stared back into the face that haunted his nightmares for three years, whiter than a skull, with wide, livid, scarlet eyes, and a nose that was flat as a snake's, with slits for nostrils. Lord Voldemort had risen again. Love it. Great, great uh, reading. Thanks, man. And then, obviously, real quick, the CGI back of Quarrel's head in uh, Sorcerer's Stone, Philosopher's Stone, which mm -hmm. was actually voiced by Richard Bremer. And so, it wasn't Ian Hart? Richard Bremer did it. Oh. Yeah. I thought Ian he, Hart, nah. I thought he did both the um, Quarrel. Oh, you, no, no. He didn't play. He just played Quarrel. Uh -huh. So, Richard Bremer actually did that. He's even credited as He Must Not Be Named. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, nice. I'll show you a photo later. You'll be like, oh, yeah. It's, 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 I would love to see a photo. <laughs> So, but uh, there, so there are two, and there's another difference about the eyes. Obviously, you said in the in the reading, uh, his eyes were slit like snake eyes. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't have been. I don't think it would have worked on screen. Me neither. Uh, there wouldn't have been a connection to the audience. He would have seemed too much like like an animal. You know, it's it, they would have had to do it differently every time, probably because exactly. of CGI. Yeah, and also his in was something maybe they couldn't figure out practically, but would have looked great. Is his fingernail? His fingers are supposed to be un unnaturally long. And they do look long in the movie, but they're supposed to be like super long uh, in the book, which would which adds to like a, a, the creepy element of the the physical look of the character. Yeah. How about we take a moment, a few moments from Voldemort and do an intermission? Oh yeah, intermission time. Right, let's let's chill for getting a so into this. Yeah. Huh? You like F that that reading voice I did at the end? You really got into it. It's pretty good. You really got into Maybe it. Maybe I should do some uh, audio books. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> Too many mess ups. <laughs> hey, you know what? <laughs> And just uh, to fact check you, I just Googled it. Ian Hart did voice Voldemort at, in Sorcerer's Stone. So it's what? Richard Bremer's face. Miss Richard Bremer's face, Ian Hart's voice to make a super Voldemort. Fact check true. <laughs> Anthony wins. <laughs> Congratulations. James is I don't want to get any unsubscribes, man. True. We yeah. would get an unsubscribe. Yeah. So Ian Hart's voice who plays Quirrell, Richard Bremer's face. They. Our other amazing sponsor is MoviePosters.com. Use our very special promo code with them, Raiders10, to get 10% off your order today. MoviePosters.com has a gigantic selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster arsenal, as well as all sorts of framing, backlighting, whatever your poster needs are, they got you covered. I just got a new one. I have um, the fake movie poster from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, Kill Me Now, Gringo, said the Ringo. Coming off Ringo, said the gringo. Yeah. 
Oh, Ringo said the Gringo. Yeah, <laughs> I love that poster. Starring Rick Dalton. Yeah, Rick Dalton. It's they have a ton of awesome posters like this. Like, who sells that poster? Nobody. It's it's amazing. They have a huge selection. We recommend them. Again, use our coupon code at movieposters.com Raiders ten to get ten percent off your order today. All right, let's do this intermission. You ready? I'm ready. Guess this movie. Oh no, I skipped. Uh oh. In a uh, <clears throat> movie quote competition. There we go. Going going great. <laughs> it's going great already. All right, let me finish the quote. It's a long one. That's what she Again. said. You wrote to me once, listing the four chief virtues. Wisdom, justice, fortitude, and temperance. As I read the list, I knew I had none of them. But I have other virtues, Father. Ambition. That can be a virtue when it drives us to excel. Resourcefulness, courage. Perhaps not on the battlefield, but there are many forms of courage. Devotion to my family and to you. But none of my virtues were on your list. Even then, I knew it was as, you, as if you didn't want me for your son. It's funny because I quoted it five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's communist and gladiator. <laughs> communist, your failures are as a son and my failures. Your faults as a son and my failures as a father. <laughs> Embrace me. <laughs> All right, here's my quote. Well, no, no. At first, they'd ask me questions they already knew I knew the answers to we ran through those and i really didn't want to give them they i really didn't want them to give me the answers so they gave me the questions and i'd look up the answers on my own as if that were any different well we ran through those in a couple of weeks and i just didn't have the time finally and it just seems silly so can you say it one more time yeah well no no at first they'd ask me questions they already knew i knew the answers to we ran through those, and I really didn't want them to give me the answers, so they gave me the questions, and I'd look up the answers on my own, as if that were any different. Well, we ran through those in a couple of weeks, and I just didn't have time. Finally, it just seemed silly. It sounds familiar, but I don't know. Quiz show. Oh, man. Ray Fiennes, Ray Fiennes. quiz show. It's a great movie. It really Directed is. by Robert Redford. Damn. The movie's awesome. I remember awesome. the first time I saw that, I was like, what? I, I've never heard of this yeah. before. First time I saw that was in high school class. My teacher showed it to us. I was like, this excellent, so excellent movie. Yeah. Black and white too. No, it's color. What am I thinking of? That's black and white. I don't know. <laughs> Fucking idiot over here. Wow. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> guess this movie release year that is in color. <laughs> the Good Shepherd, <laughs> two thousand five, two thousand six. Damn it, <laughs> idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Guess this movie release year. Your favorite black and white film. <laughs> white chicks? <laughs> Quiz show. <laughs> 1992. Four. Ah. Close. Close, but no cigar. Movie pop quiz time. What Western did Clint Eastwood and Richard Harris star in together? Unforgiven. Can you remember uh, Richard Harris' character name? I fucking always forget it. <laughs> oh, man. What's his friggin' name? I always forget his name. You've asked me this. like I, I think I've used that for a podcast yeah. question before. Uh, it's uh, Little little Richard. Little. Little. I'm pretty sure that was a musician. Yeah. It's a little, uh, little something. It, it has to do with where he's from. I can't remember. It's uh, English Bob. English Bob. I always forget. Little Bill is Gene Little Hackman. Little Bill. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, it's English Bob, right? Yeah. yeah it's I don't know. You got the question. Yeah, bro. English Bob. English Robert. Okay. That movie's also in black and white. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's not. definitely not. <laughs> Jimmy thinks every movie made before 2000 was in black and Shut white. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I'm a Marvel stan, bro. <laughs> okay, here's my quiz question. Ray Fiennes played a serial killer in what movie? Wow, that's a good question. Um, hmm. Ray Fiennes as mm -hmm. oh, that's uh, easy. yeah, I almost got you. I don't know why. I almost got you. I was thinking of Liam Neeson's face in my head. <laughs> what? I don't know why. I don't know why. It's Red uh, Red Dragon. Red Dragon is correct. <laughs> that's a sick movie. He's great in that movie. Yeah. 
Philip so, Seymour Hoffman. He's a in terrifying it. serial yeah. killer. In Emily that. Watson's in it. Edward Norton plays um, the detective. It's I can't a, remember his name. Underrated movie. It's actually um, the same book that uh, Michael Mann's Manhunter is based on. Yeah. Red Dragon. Super creepy. Super creepy. Manhunter by Michael Mann is also an excellent movie. All right. Uh, who we got for uh, Biggest Haters of the Week? Any unsubscribes? Biggest Haters? Well, um, we filmed two episodes today, so we haven't had any unsubscribes since. All right. Cool. So, yeah. Sorry, y'all. We did back to back today. And also, yeah, we did go back to back. Yeah. Also, we don't have any new five star reviews. But we have a new Godfather. Cammy Strickfadden. Cammy. Cammy, always interacting with us. Oh we my love you. Yeah, she, uh, Cammy joined as our, our God, Godfather tier. A Godfather, Godfather tier. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little wine. The Boston's coming out. Um, Cammy. We made you an offer you good at refuse. The day of our Voldemort episode. <laughs> <laughs> but Cammy. seriously. I, I've forgotten you. <laughs> oh, Cammy. Cammy. <laughs> almost forgot you, you were became here. a godfather patron. <laughs> uh, she chose Stephen King movies as her bonus review, which would be a lot of fun. Nice. Because there's like a 87 lot. of them, I think. <laughs> so we'll pick our favorites, I think. We yeah. can do like maybe a ranking of the top 10, top quite, 15. Quite a few. Quite a few. Also, there's another one coming out this year, Sam's Lot. Oh, yeah, that's true. A new adaptation, not a remake. Another new another adaptation <laughs> of the new one hopefully it's good but cammy thank you so much for joining our our patreon especially the godfather too we appreciate it it helps us do the show full time so you're the best thank you moving on to on this day in film history today is july 28th in 1932 white zombie the first feature-length zombie film is released directed by victor halperin in 1951 alice in wonderland the musical and animated musical is released in 1954 on the waterfront is released in 1978, Animal House is released. In 1993, Robin Hood, Men in Tights is released. In 1999, Deep Blue Sea is released. The and shark ate me! The motherfucking shark <laughs> ate me! <laughs> <laughs> and there are no interesting birthdays today. <laughs> if it's a listener's birthday, then happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, listener. Uh, my streaming recommendation is Crazy Heart, which oh, is on nice. Amazon Prime now. Just got added. My streaming recommendation is The English Patient on HBO Max. Ray finds stars in this film. It was uh, nominated for a bunch of awards. It won Best Picture. Anthony Mangella won Best Director as well. It's a really incredible film. I highly recommend you check it out. And also, every time we make content or videos about Ray Fiennes, people always say it's, it's pronounced Ralph. Yes, Ralph. It's actually, it's actually pronounced Rafe. It's spelled like Ralph, but it's yeah. pronounced Rafe. He has uh, Welsh origins, and so that's the, the Welsh pronunciation of that word. Ralph, Name. it's Rafe. All right, let's get back into Voldemort. How about we talk about Voldemort's abilities at the height of his power? I love that, and then I want to move into something else. It's going to blow everyone's mind. Oh, I can't wait. Okay, let's talk about his powers. So height, at the height of his power, before his death. When he was his, Super Saiyan? And then his, restor <laughs> his restoration. <laughs> Obviously, he had mastery over the magical arts, over magic. He also had mastery over the dark arts. He also had the ability of necromancy, which is... Obviously, creating and free, and Voldemort was the only dark wizard in fairy. In the, fairy, yeah. known to have the ability to create and control in fairy using the dark art of necromancy and an army at that. Though, and now it, the in fairy. Sorry for those of you who don't know, their uh, corpses that are brought to life, reanimated, yeah, reanimated with magic. Though it is implied that other dark wizards had used or intended to use them, dueling Voldemort is highly skilled, only matched and paralleled by Albus Dumbledore. Potions, Voldemort was exceptionally knowledgeable at potions, he, as he was aware of an advanced potion, advanced dark regeneration potion that could resurrect him to full power and corporeal form, which he successfully guided Pettigrew into brewing, although him allowing him to regain a corporeal body and full power. He also possessed such incredible talents and skills in potions that he was capable of inventing advanced potions such as the Emerald Potion or the Drink of Despair, which he used to protect Salazar Slytherin's locket within the Horcrux cave and would show those who drank it visions of the thing they feared the most at the rudimentary body potions area. And in, in what's cool about that, creating a potion that no one had ever created before, uh, things that it's not really touched on in the movies, but wizards can still, you know, create magic or in, in a sense discover a spell, uh, like how Snape discovered Sectum Sempra. No one else knew that spell. Voldemort, when he left school and he left Borgen and Burtz, he traveled the world and he was living like in an undisclosed area in a different country. I think it was like Romania or something. 
and he was experimenting and he was delving into magic and trying new magic and experimenting with magic and uh, tr maybe probably trying to harken back to ancient techniques and develop techniques that no one had ever discovered. So there is an aspect to magic in, in the world where not everything, not every spell has been created, not every spell has been used or, or discovered, and wizards can still kind of create magic or discover a spell that can work when you say a certain thing and, and wisp your wand in a certain way. So uh, he spent a lot of time basically experimenting and developing his powers after school. And he also, he even bragged multiple times, I think, to uh, maybe it was Dumbledore or someone else, that he pushed the limits of yes, yeah. wizard of magic to further than achieve yeah. heights of immortality, for, reach further than anyone before. Yeah. With the Horcruxes. Next up, a charm. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I want to, more about the power. Sorry. Um, you really get to see how capable he and Dumbledore are when they battle in order. Because you see the other duels, especially the order versus Death Eaters, they're just like, cute sparks. Yeah, sparks. Protego. <laughs> <laughs> all this, it's all the same shit. <laughs> Some shit comes Spelly out. Spelly Armis and Nevada Cadaver. But when. Voldemort and Dumbledore are battling. The magic is on a massive scale. They're creating like actual things like the giant fire snake and turning a huge cloud of sharp glass into sand. They're in creating an orb out of this huge body of water. Like amazing, incredible, powerful magic that no other wizard alive is capable of except for these two. And you can really see that finally the limits of wizarding power how capable they can be in Order of the Phoenix. Yeah, and how there's a crazy spectrum between them two and everybody else. Yeah. Next up, charms. Voldemort was actually extremely skillful with charms. He was able to cast a disillusionment charm so powerful that it hit him from his own eyes, a very advanced level of magic. Occlumency and legilimency. Legilimency being able to effectively shield his mind and able to penetrate the minds of others with occlumency. He was particularly talented and skilled in legilimency. And as an adult, I'm sorry, I got this reversed. And as, an, as, as an adult, Snape claimed that he was the most accomplished legilimens the world had ever seen. And so Snape teaches Harry occlumens to defend, defend against legilimency. And what's also interesting about Voldemort's powers is. Most kids, they before they go to Hogwarts, if they're raised in a wizarding school, they know they're magical. They they can do little things like very subtle, nothing too crazy. They can maybe move something by accident. By accident, and then kids who grow up Muggle-born, like Harry, things will happen without them knowing it's happening, like the glass disappearing in in the zoo, things like that. And also in the books, lots of things have happened in the past with Harry that are unexplainable. Yeah, ha once I, I I got my cousin trapped into a snake pit. <laughs> He says something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he says, once I, I, set, I set, a bow, a set, bow, set a bow on my cousin, on my Dudley. cousin Dudley. Yeah. Um, but the thing with Tom that separated him from probably any other kid, and which really surprised Dumbledore when he went to visit him in the orphanage, is Dumbledore saw that Tom's powers were pretty well developed, and he was controlling them already. He didn't know what they were. He didn't know that he had magic. But he was talking to snakes. He was doing things to kids. He... Um, there's that story of actually I have a quote of, of what, him leading the kids into the cave. So it was very, it's very, very rare and extremely uncommon for, especially uh, a, a a wizard born amongst Muggles, raised by Muggles, to develop their magical powers without any kind of knowledge about the wizarding world or training. It was un, it was just unheard of before, even for Dumbledore. Yeah, that's why the book scene of that moment of Dumbledore meeting. Uh, Riddle for the first time is so fascinating because they go more into the nuance of that situation and complexity of Tom Riddle, how powerful and how much unusual control he had over his magic at such a young age. We didn't even know that wizards and witches existed and he knew he was special. he just been waiting for someone to come basically to tell him that he was special. And so he could move objects with his mind and cause them to float wherever he wished, manipulate animals and creatures as he wished. He could speak parcel tongue, use his power to inflict harm on other orphans. After getting into a fight with fellow orphan Billy Stubbs, he used his powers to hang the boy's rabbit from the rafters. On one occasion, he took two other orphans, Dennis Bishop and Amy Benson, into a cave where he performed an act so horrifying that the two orphans were traumatized into silence. Afterwards, he may have told them in some means not to tell anyone what happened in the cave, where he also would steal from the other orphans and hide their things in the cupboard like trophies. And that cave is the same cave where he hides the locket. The Horcrux Cave. They don't explain exactly what he did to the kids. I can't remember. They never do. Never. What's really fascinating about Tom in that sequence, they they captured it well in the movie, is 
when he learns that there's other wizards who are like him, he's dis- he's mad. He's disappointed. He thought he was the only one until Dumbledore showed up. And in a way, yeah, he's like almost let down. Yeah, he's he's like because he he was like I'm special. He's had this opinion of himself since he was little. Like I am better than everyone. Nobody else is like me. And so when Dumbledore shows up and says, "There's a whole community of wizards," it's actually kind of disappointing to Tom, thinking that there are other people who can do things that I can do. That friggin' sucks. I thought I was the only one. <laughs> so that has been with him. That desire to be better than everyone else and to be greater has always been with him since he was a child, and he was so disappointed to learn that there was other wizards. Now back to Legilimency, his frighteningly exceptional powers at Legilimency allowed Voldemort to delve and peer deep into the minds of others without needing to say the incantation or using his wand, seeing their deepest thoughts, and he can even use Legilimency to influence the minds that he invaded and control them. Voldemort also could fly. He was able to and invented the ability to fly without support, defying the law of magic that states objects can only fly through the use of a flying charm. He first exhibited this flying ability when in pursuit of Harry Potter over Little Whinging in Deathly Hallows. He frequently used his ability to fly through the Second Wizarding War and was known to have taught Severus Snape and some other Death Eaters how to duplicate the feat in the movie. I think Snape was the only one in the books that could do it. Yeah, it's pretty common in the movie that Death Eaters are doing it. Is it yeah, it works for the yeah, cinematic experience. Yeah, it's visually experience. cool. Uh, obviously, we all know he can speak parcel tongue, talk to snakes. Alchemy, Voldemort was learned in the ancient art and science of alchemy to the point where he was confident that he was able to steal the Philosopher's Stone, that if he was able to steal the Philosopher's Stone, he would be able to not only use it to produce the elixir of life, but also manipulate the process of doing so in a manner that would allow him to create a body of his own for his mangled soul to inhabit, thus restoring himself. Also, wandless and nonverbal magic. Voldemort was also immensely accomplished at both wandless and nonverbal magic, enough so to be capable of using both effortlessly. He could also move objects magically without the incantations to do so normally. Also, he had the power of possession and memory modification. He was very adept at that. And also, that makes me think that in Sorcerer's Stone, going through all the challenges that were protecting the Sorcerer's Stone, obviously... He was kind of running that game, especially in the books with the potion uh, riddle that Snape left for them and everything. So you can assume that Voldemort was in control, obviously, of how that outcome would be, except for the the flying, I guess, for the key. Yeah. But Voldemort is clearly the reason why they got past all the guards and the uh, obstacles to get to the Sorcerer's Stone. Yeah, absolutely. Him and Coral. Yeah. Is that all for his powers? I can't think of there's any, there's yeah. so many more, but those are like the big guns. Like there's so many other like little things here and there. Yeah. All right. I have a pretty cool subject we can talk about for a bit. Is this what's gonna blow my hair back? It's gonna blow your hair back. Well, actually, it might not blow your hair back. We're we're pretty well well read. <laughs> we're well versed in Harry Potter. The thing with Voldemort is as capable and powerful and great of leader he is. He actually makes a lot of major mistakes along his way during his journey both during and before the books and there's a bunch of there's a bunch of mistakes some of them are a little more subtle but i think there are i have one two three four five six seven major mistakes that voldemort makes which lead to his downfall get the obvious one out of the way trusting severus snape was his biggest mistake the reason why he trusted severus snape continuously for after two, the death of lily. after the death of lily because first of all his inability to understand love he thought that snape was physically desirous of Lily, and that was it. And because he does, he doesn't understand love. Because in the books, he says you can have any woman you yeah, want yeah. afterwards. Yeah, exactly. Because he he just thought that Sna- that Snape like wanted Lily de- out of desire, not out of love. And so that's why. And then on top of that, Snape being an extremely powerful wizard himself, being able to hide his true motivations from the Dark Lord because of Occlumency. Yeah, Snape Occlumency. was the most accomplished Occlumency, you could say. Yeah, exactly. So. It's both those things, the his powers at Occlumency, and then also Voldemort's misunderstanding of how Snape viewed Lily. That's what led to him trusting Snape. Even though like, you can look back on it like, obviously, like, how could you trust Snape? That's why. So that was the first major mistake. And because Dumbledore understood love, that's why he could trust Snape. Exactly. So that is what motivated Snape to turn against Voldemort in the first place. Now, there's a new another major, major mistake that is Voldemort's mistake with Creature. Creature being the house elf of the Blacks, Sirius and Regulus and their family. So Regulus was a death a Death Eater, and then he he left the Death Eaters. He was uh, he did not like the direction they were going. Um, and Voldemort, 
uh, he viewed it as an enemy from then on, and he wanted to somehow find a way to def- to get rid of to defeat Voldemort, Regulus, Sirius's brother. Voldemort, on the other hand, he was trying to figure out how to where to put his his uh, Horcruxes, and he he picked the cave for the locket to place, and so he developed this the spells within the cave first with the Inferi in the water, and then also. The biggest spell, the most important spell about the cave was you could not um, apparate outside of the, out of the cave. Once you were in the cave, even if you were a very powerful wizard, you were trapped. There was no way of getting out. And so only Voldemort could get out of it. And so he obviously, Voldemort had to go inside to put the locket in and he wanted to test it. The, the potion that he made. Well, I and think you needed human blood to get in and out. To get in. To get in, but you can't. You cannot apparate out. But you can't. But you, you, but can, you can, get, can physically get out. Can get I'm out. sorry. I'm sorry. You have to. But the bodies of the army of Inferi are gonna kill you. Yeah, yeah. So that's the only way out is to get through an army of Inferi. And so he also wanted to make sure that the potion worked. The special potion that you mentioned earlier that he basically created uh, to guard the locket within that shell. Magical pina colada. <laughs> <laughs> can I get a tahini rim on this? <laughs> I love a tahini rim. And so the way to test this out was to bring creature. And uh, so he took Regulus's house elf creature, brought him to the cave, and then he forced creature to drink the potion. And it was disastrous for creature, torturous to him. But Voldemort saw that the potion worked. And Voldemort, he mistakenly believed that elves were so inferior to wizards that if uh, an ordinary, I'm sorry, you can't in the book you can't apparate out in the book. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. But they never, yeah, they never yeah, touched yeah. on the movie. Yeah. You're right about yeah. you cannot apparate. Okay, in thank out. you. Sorry. But because creatures, not, yeah, he's an elf. He can't yeah, get out. Yeah. So, so, but so, however, Voldemort thought I mean, he can't like yeah. physically get out. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So Voldemort thought he's just an elf. Um, he's just gonna die here. Uh, and he leaves. and then so Voldemort leaves creature there with the locket back in the water. However, elves often have powers that wizards do not understand, and and in, in many cases they can be more powerful than wizards. Uh, elves are obviously used as indentured servants and even as in slave labor. But they are very powerful beings, and creature unknowingly to Voldemort got out of there no problem. He apparated right out. Voldemort underestimated the power of elves, and so when creature returned to the Black family household, he told Regulus about the locket and he told Regulus about the cave. And then Regulus, when he learned this, he went to the cave and he took the locket. So that's how the, the locket was taken from the cave. In the movie, we don't know any of he, this. And he, for, he made creature force feed force him feed the him the potion. To, to the potion instead of it. Regulus ended up becoming. Uh, a great redemptive, redemptive arc for the character, but in the movies we just Harry just gets the locket with the R E B on it, and so you're like, who is this R E B? And this is the story of how that locket came to uh, creature, and then creature obviously it was nicked by um, what's his name, um, Mendungus Fletcher. Fletcher. And so that's how that locket got to be from at creature Grimmel at Grimmel Place. Grimmel Place. Dobby, can you operate out of this basement? Of course, I'm, I'm an elf. <laughs> <laughs> great, great reference. Sick reference, bro. Your references are out of control. Everybody, Everybody knows, knows that. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a huge mistake. This is a huge mistake by Voldemort to underestimate the power of elves. And he underestimates everyone, basically. Yeah, exactly. So huge mistake. It led to his downfall. Great point. What's another mistake? Okay, the room of requirement mistake. So, like I said earlier, we all know he put Rowan and Ravenclaw's to Adam inside the room of requirement not only because it was hogwarts was special to him but voldemort he assumed that nobody else knew the room of requirement existed he thought that he was so intelligent and he had discovered every single secret about hogwarts castle he thought nobody else had ever discovered obviously the chamber secrets among other things and also the room of requirement he thought that it was his discovery alone and so that's why he put the Rowan and Ravenclaw's diadem in there. And also, that's why when Harry shows up at Hogwarts, Voldemort, in the books, he still doesn't think Harry will ever find Rowan and Ravenclaw's diadem because nobody could ever know about this special room that I discovered. So it was another mistake of his to think that only he knew about the room of requirement. And that's why he came back to Hogwarts, right? Was to hide yeah. the re- her diadem so, in the so, room of requirement. Yeah, so like fake meeting yeah. with Dumbledore. When he was like walking in Dumbledore's office, he snuck over there, hid the diadem, and then went into the Dumbledore's office. Took a piss and yeah. he's like, All right. <laughs> <laughs> Wrote Voldemort was here in the wall. <laughs> die, muggles, die. Dumb- Dumbledore sucks. <laughs> <laughs> we stand, Voldy. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> he was so arrogant and 
uh, believed himself to be so highly intelligent and superior to everyone else that he thought nobody else ever discovered the room of acquirement, where unbeknownst to him, many students discovered the room in over the history of Hogwarts. That's why there's so much shit in there. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff in there. But when it's something you want, there's only what you want inside of it. You know what I mean? Exactly. But just the main room, if you like, you just, I want the room of acquirement, everything is in there. Yeah. Hence the Deathly Hallows scene. And so, <laughs> and Jenny, Harry and Ginny's awkward first kiss. <laughs> Close your eyes. I did not consent to this kiss. <laughs> Lady, girl, I was closed. My eyes were closed. <laughs> Ew, yucky. <laughs> Germs. <laughs> okay, next up, uh, our third, our fourth major mistake Voldemort made was trusting Lucius Malfoy with his diary. Now, Lucius, ever since he was young, has always been a quote, loyal servant to the Dark Lord. But he has never been a true believer, and every chance he gets, he escapes from the Dark Lord. I think he fears the Dark Lord more than he actually is loyal to him, hence, uh, once they get Draco, her and our, him and our sister leave Hogwarts, and they bounce during the battle. Draco! He is never, he's never been completely loyal to Voldemort, hence why when, when Voldemort does return, he's, he's like, I, we, there was no sign, and Voldemort was, was like, there were more than, there were signs and more than whispers. So Lucius, even though he's he looks like he's the most most loyal Death Eater there could ever be, he is actually quite the opposite. And so Voldemort was kind of fooled by this, and he trusted Voldemort. He trusted Lucius with his diary. He gave Lucius the diary before he went to attack Harry Potter. Um, it wasn't like, oh, I'm worried I'm going to die. He just gave it to him some time before that. As a, safekeeping, he didn't explain it was a Horcrux. He didn't explain what that his piece of his soul was in it, but he told. Lucius, this is very important. I need you to keep this safe. However, after Lu after Voldemort's death, many years later, we know in Chamber of Secrets, Lucius snuck the diary into Ginny Weasley's cauldron. Now, the reason why Lucius did this was two reasons. Uh, we learned through Arthur Weasley that uh, in the books there are many inspections going on of people looking of the Ministry trying to take away dark artifacts from wizards all over the community. And so Lucius, obviously, he's going to be target number one. He's trying to get rid of anything that would tie him to Voldemort, not knowing how important this item was to Voldemort and what really true, truly led, lied within that diary, Voldemort's soul. He gave it to Ginny Weasley, a true believer, a real pure loyalist to Voldemort. Like if he gave the if he gave the diary to Bellatrix, she wouldn't have given that away, but he gave her she the snore, right? She would have every night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he already gave her, he, she would have never shut up. <laughs> she would have she been writing to me all day. <laughs> Tom would be like, Jesus, relax. What are you thinking about now, Tom? <laughs> I had such a long Tom, day, Tom. Where, where are you, Tom? Where are you? I miss you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I went to the bathroom. Did you get my message? <laughs> <laughs> but she already had the sword, so we can't give a Horcrux to more than one Horcrux to her. And so it was a mistake to trust Lucius with the diary because the sword's it, not a Horcrux, though. I'm sorry. You said you said this, you can't give her more than one Horcrux. I'm sorry. The sword's not a Horcrux. The um, what's in there? The the the, the goblet. Goblet. Yeah. Yeah, goblet's goblet. Goblet's in there. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Thank you for correcting me. Don't worry, I got you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was a major mistake to trust Lucius with such an important item because obviously it ended up, ended up becoming destroyed by the end of the chamber. Major mistake by Harry in the Basilisk. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So huge mistake. Great point. That is a great mistake. Huge mistake. Yeah. And then um, we actually already touched on the other major mistake: listening to the prophecy, hearing the prophecy, and acting on it was his biggest mistake because it was only partial. Not only because yeah, yeah. not only that on because it. but acting on it. If he had not acted on the prophecy, Harry would have never been scarred. He, he, a piece of Voldemort's soul never would have been put on him. Lily would have never sacrificed herself and created the magic love protection seal upon Harry. And Voldemort could have probably risen to power much more easily and without much interference, he could have gotten rid of Dumbledore, maybe. And so actually listening to the prophecy was a major mistake and acting on it. Yeah, but you could argue that prophecies are just fate that are going to happen and it's inevitable. Yeah, but he never would have attacked Harry if he hadn't heard the prophecy. I know, exactly. Yeah. And if the prophecy is not made, then he doesn't do it. True. True that. So then, what would the prophecy even be about? Well, actually, the ministry is full of prophecies that were never fulfilled, right? Well, they just—they're just prophecies. Yeah. We don't. You, I, we, but like, someone has to hear their prophecy to actually make it happen. True. So prophecies are just like, I feel like if they're not acted upon, they don't really exist. But if you hear it, how can you not act upon it? Exactly. Like, like That's if, what I'm saying. Like, if that's you, the mistake. If you read a prophecy that said, "Yeah, you will go in your closet and find a million dollars," <laughs> <laughs> like you're not gonna go in your closet. <laughs> 
<laughs> Obviously, I'm gonna go in my fucking I'm loving closet. my Trelawney impression, by the way. <laughs> <It's> hard, <laughs> you sound more like Jerry Seinfeld than Trelawney. What's the deal with prophecies? <laughs> <laughs> yep, Jerry Seinfeld. It's definitely Seinfeld. Yeah, you go, yeah it's Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> You're impressed with it now? <laughs> the Dark Lord will rise again! George, he who must not be named! <laughs> not bad, it's pretty good. Pretty good sign, fella. I should practice, yeah, should practice it. Yeah, I should. Uh, yeah, that would be. Yeah, I'd definitely do that <laughs> for a Seinfeld episode. Be a great skill to have. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, want to hear my Seinfeld, Seinfeld impression? <laughs> do I have to dance like that? <laughs> yeah. All right, let's move on. Are there any okay. more? Mis- yeah, 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 yeah. More mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> Not any more mistakes. <laughs> Voldemort's one of Voldemort's biggest mistakes out of all was not understanding the Elder Wand. Now Voldemort believed that loyalty of the Elder Wand transferred f- through death. So if you if you were the master of the Elder Wand and I killed you, then I became master of the Elder Wand. That's Are how you he- projecting. <laughs> You're the only one here. I'm just kidding. <laughs> now I am. <laughs> and so he believed that if you killed the owner of the ma- of the Elder Wand, even if you like you didn't beat them in the duel, but if you, like, stat- slit their throat, you became master of the other one. This actually happens in the Peveril story. Um, but what he doesn't understand is that the loyalty of the other one actually passes through whomever forcibly defeats the other wizard, and it doesn't have to be through death, it can just be through force, and this happens multiple times. So, he thinks that Snape is the true master of the Elder One after Dumbledore's death, because Snape is the one who killed Dumbledore. But what Voldemort didn't realize was that Draco was the true master of the Elder Wand because he disarmed Dumbledore before Snape killed him. And so the Elder Wand never belonged to Snape. And then, so he's completely mixing up how the loyalty passes. And then Harry becomes the master of the Elder Wand after he disarms Draco in Deathly Hallows. Steals a bunch of wands from him. Oh yeah, steals a boatload of wands. (laughs) And so when Harry is dueling Voldemort at the end in the Great Hall, Harry knows I have the great wand. I mean, he has the he has the elder wand, and it's loyal to me. And the elder wand will not kill Harry because he is the master of it. And that's the one of the biggest mistakes Voldemort made in his entire life was not understanding the elder wand completely. Great point. Thank you. Any more mistakes? Yes. Let's go. I like these. Thanks, man. I put a lot of research into this. I got I got a bunch of notes too, man. I'm really I really appreciate the effort you put in. <laughs> having a blast. It's my favorite episode we recorded in a while. It is. It's it's anything Harry Potter, man. I don't, we could have just we made just have Harry a Harry Potter, Potter podcast. podcast. <laughs> we should. We, why not? Who wants to hear a second podcast of us just talk yeah, about Harry Potter? Real, let us know. It'll be a banger. Okay, and then uh, the last one I have listed. And again, I only did major. There's lots of mistakes he made, like talking to Slughorn. That's you could say is a mistake, but he needed to learn about Horcruxes. He needed definitive in- answers yeah, to the question. So it's not really a mistake, even though it ended up becoming a a, a, a way of Harry and D- Dumbledore defeating him. But another major mistake that um, Voldemort made that led to his downfall was trusting Narcissa Malfoy. Now this is again ties to his inability to understand love, and so he didn't understand that Narcissa would do anything it took to get Draco out of Hogwarts to save her child. Love. Love. The love of Narcissa for Draco. Love. Love. (laughs) And so Voldemort, like you said, he's afraid of Harry. He's afraid to even go near Harry after he wakes up from limbo. And so he he asks Narcissa to go check on Harry. I love how he pushes Bella up. I don't need your help. (laughs) I don't need your help. (laughs) I love Ray Fiennes. He's great. And then, um, so Narcissa goes up to Harry's body, which uh, the Death Eaters think is a dead corpse because Harry has has purposely not moved an inch. And so Narcissa, when she gets close to Harry, she she sees he's breathing. She knows he's alive. And so she very subtly whispers, is Draco alive? And then Harry carefully in the slightest way nods yes telling her yes draco's alive in hogwarts and so narcissa stands up and turns to voldemort and said and says dead so she, voldemort trusts narcissa to tell her whether harry's dead or not she clearly lies to save her own son major major mistake by mouth by uh, voldemort any more that's it for the major ones there's another major mistake oh nice. which in voldemort's eyes to him looks like a major strength but the fact 
of committing horcruxes and creating horcruxes is yeah. a major mistake for your soul. So a horcrux is an object in which a dark wizard or witch had hidden a fragment of his or her soul in order to become immo- immortal. As long as the object remained intact, so too did the soul fragment inside it, keeping the maker anchored to the world of the living, even if their body suffered fatal damage. The horcrux was considered the mo- to be the most terrible of all dark magic. Horcruxes could only be committed and created after committing murder, the supreme act of evil as a means to tear the soul. The process for the creation of a horcrux involved a spell and a horrific act was performed soon after the murder had been committed. Given that horcruxes were precious to those who made them, they were usually protective measures made to prevent them from being stolen or destroyed, such as counter charms and cur- curses. Horcruxes were also very durable, requiring some of the most potent elements of the wizarding world to destroy them, such as basilisk venom and fiend fire. And every time you create a horcrux, you tear your soul apart. That's how you create a horcrux, by committing murder. Every act of murder tears your soul apart. And every act of murder that Voldemort created or committed, even if it wasn't creating a horcrux, tore his soul apart. So not even just creating the horcrux, but every murder he he put out tore his soul apart. Now, he created six extra horcruxes. Six Horcruxes splitting his soul into seven pieces. With each Horcrux, he became less and less human, both emotionally and physically, which left him what he thought was impenetrable If and if no one ever discovered his secret or tried to defeat him. But because Dumbledore was so clever and figured it out, and he used and gave Harry all the information necessary to dis- destroy the Horcruxes and defeat Voldemort, after Voldemort's death, his biggest mistake, I think, was creating the Horcruxes, where now his last fragment of his soul lives on for eternity in limbo with no escape. And ironically, for someone who wanted to live forever, if he had not torn his soul apart when he died, he could have become a ghost if he chose to and basically live forever. And as so a now, ghost. ironically, like you said, he, he, he his biggest fear was death, and now he's living in eternity in pain yeah. as a shriveled piece of a soul yeah exactly it's 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 man what a fitting end though what a fitting end let's talk about the horcruxes yeah also i would say it might be a mistake to have made a uh, nagini a horcrux like a living being how come she's vulnerable she's always next to him yeah, she's she, always with him i think he's like i got six of these things what's the big deal <laughs> no, he, he did it because connection to slytherin yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but also he's like i got six of them so okay <laughs> eh, whatever yeah, yeah. be my my charizard pokemon I got, card whatever i, I lose one no big deal <laughs> Let's get into the Horcruxes. So, again, Voldemort made six. Harry Potter was the intentional seventh. So, all in all, there are actually eight Horcruxes about in the world. This whole franchise. He wanted to have seven in total. He wanted seven. He thought there was only seven because, obviously, there's a piece of the soul inside Voldemort. So, he's technically the seventh Horcrux, you could say. But he made six. The six Horcruxes that he made, besides Harry Potter, which was the seventh accidental Horcrux, Tom Riddle's diary was the first Horcrux that Tom Riddle made. The hiding place was, let's see, uh, hold on. Tom Riddle's diary, it was created by the murder of Myrtle Warren by the Serpent of Slytherin Mm -hmm. in First Floor Girls Lavatory, Hogwarts Castle. His second Horcrux was the Marvalo Gaunt's Ring, which was created with the uh, murder of Tom Riddle Sr. with Morphin Gaunt's wand. Location was at the Riddle House. Destroyed by Albus Dumbledore, and cut with the Godric Gryffindor sword, and, also- and Tom actually he liked to wear the ring around <laughs> yeah, as he opposed wore- to usually hiding his Horcruxes. He liked to show it off because of the connection it had to um, Slytherin. That's why the the ring is cracked in the movies because Dumbledore already destroyed it with yeah. the sword of Gryffindor, and the obviously the diary was destroyed by Harry Potter with a basilisk fang. And you actually see the ring also in Half Blood Prince memory when he's sitting with Slughorn. Bingo. Salazar Slytherin's locket is the th- third Horcrux he made. He created murder. He created with the Muggle Tramp. That's just the name of what happened. It was destroyed by Ron Weasley, who stabbed with the Godric's Gryffindor sword in the Forest of Dean, Gloucestershire. The next in the fourth Horcrux he created was Helga Hufflepuff's cup, created with the murder of Hepzibah Smith, who was that That's woman name. who he charmed and stole the art, the Hufflepuff cup from, who, had, who was very wealthy. He would visit her often, and she had a huge crush on him. Well, he worked yeah. at Borgen and Burke. It was destroyed by Hermione Granger, stabbed with a basilisk fang in the Chamber of Secrets. The next Horcrux was Rowena Ravenclaw's diadem. He created it with the murder of an Albanian peasant in Albania. It was destroyed. That's where he was. I'm sorry. Albania. Not Romania, not Romania. Romania. Yeah. 
destroyed accidentally by Vincent Crab in the Room of Requirement using Fiend Fire. The next Horcrux in the final Horcrux that he thought he created was Nagini, created with the murder of Bertha Jorkins in Albania, destroyed by Neville Longbottom by beheading Nagini with the sword of Godric Gryffindor on the front steps of Hogwarts during the Battle of Hogwarts, and of course the accidental um, Horcrux he created in Unintentional with Harry Potter, with the murder of Lily James Potter in Godric's Hollow. Killing Curse was used, and ironically, he's the one who destroyed it. Now, there's actually kind of another, technically, ninth Horcrux out there. Can you think of what it is? It's only uh, for one book. What do you mean for one book? It's only in one book it's feature. In one book? Yeah, in one movie. It's in a movie? Was it? Is it an item? Like it's a, a human. Human? Or it's a wi- wizard. That would be a Horcrux. Mm-hmm. Technically. Well, is it um, Lily Potter? Quirrell. Professor Quirin- Quirinus oh, Quirrell. Oh, yeah. Technically a, uh, a Horcrux. So according to J.K. Rowling in Pottermore, she stated that Professor Quirrell served as a temporary Horcrux when Voldemort's soul possessed his body during Harry Potter's first year at Hogwarts. Mm. So, actually, there was a nine, so he would be the eighth because Voldemort's soul, that was a Horcrux just floating around and it attached itself to yeah. Quirrell. So, technically, Quirrell was a Horcrux for a short period of time. Now, speaking of Quirrell, how come Quirrell went to go find Voldemort? I mean, he was a teacher at Hogwarts, and why would he just go looking for Voldemort in the world? Now, As a young boy, Quirrell was teased and neglected for his timid nature, although very intelligent, high IQ. He he began to develop a desire for recognition and greatness, and he was feeling cynical for the society he was living in, being seduced by the dark arts, and he just didn't want people to laugh at him anymore. And so after- They're not laughing now. (laughs) After teaching Muggle studies for some time, he took a year-long sabbatical in 1990 in order to gain first-hand experience, although in reality he had taken a grand tour around the world in order to hopefully find whatever remained of Voldemort after his first defeat, partly out of curiosity, partly out of that acknowledged desire for importance from his childhood. And this is a quote from Lord Voldemort in the novels, recounting his meeting with Quirrell. A wizard, uh, a wizard, young, foolish, and gullible, wandered across my path in the forest, I had made my home. Oh, he seemed the very chance I had been dreaming of, for he was a teacher at Dumbledore School. He was easy to bend to my will. He brought me back to this country, and after a while, I took possession of his body to supervise him closely as he carried out my orders. I wonder where he kept Voldemort, like in a jar? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> his soul? Before before he connected to him? Oh, Voldemort? Yeah. It's just like an ether. Yeah. And I think he was just attached to animals uh-huh. so that he could survive. So I think he was just attached to the closest living object he could. He caught him in a mason jar. <laughs> Just put you in a jar, jar. on the mental piece. <laughs> You're an afterbirth, After. Eli. <laughs> Goodness. What's really, really crazy about Tom Riddle is that by the time he was in his sixth year at Hogwarts, he had already made two Horcruxes. Nuts. So it was, it was the diary in the ring. Yes, and I'm not sure exactly. I can't remember what year he made the diary. I think it was his fourth or fifth year. So he was so young. He also he already committed a murder. So not only had he had committed murder twice at such a young age, but he had already found the means to make himself immortal. That he was pursuing that. You you gotta think like his first year in school, Tom must have been like looking through the restrict restricted section, searching for answers, and like every other student was just like, Oh, this is awesome. I'm at Hogwarts finally. Look at all the food. Yeah. Whereas Tom's like, How do I make myself fucking immortal? as like an 11 year old. It's just really fascinating. Now, let's talk about his time at Hogwarts. So Tom Riddle thrived as a student. He was very brilliant. He, in his seventh year at Hogwarts, was made head boy. Before that, he was a prefect multiple years. He earned outstanding marks in every examination he took. He also received a medal for magical merit, as well as special services award to the school for- Chamber. Revealing and catching Hagrid as the opener of the Chamber of Secrets, which was a lie, like Anthony stated earlier. He framed Hagrid in order to keep the school open because they were going to close it and it was his real home. So he ended up closed the, the school. While at Hogwarts at a young age, Tom Riddle was very curious about his family history. And he looked everywhere for his last name, trying to find some sign of his father or his family, looking for Riddle in the trophy rooms, in, in the walls, in the portraits. 
He discovered eventually that his father was not a wizard. His father was a muggle. And he got pissed about it. He killed him. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, and, and I believe, so it's in Chamber of the Secrets that his special services to the ward, to the school, it's mentioned in when Ron Weasley is polishing the he's, trophies. He's tro yeah. polishing the trophy room. He's, he vomits <laughs> slugs all over Rid Riddle's badge. Yeah. What's really he has great? To polish it several times. Yeah, and what? And Tom, he, he he was very popular at school as well. And it was all basically a front, and everybody loved Tom, except for Dumbledore. Dumbledore, he he kind of saw through this veneer that Tom put up, and he obviously he didn't know that Tom was this evil, murderous being, at such a young age. But Tom always knew that Dumbledore saw kind of the true side of him and always kept a close watch on him especially with the chamber of the yeah. secret situation which yeah. he did that in his fifth year yeah fifth year thank you and so dumbledore is someone who tom never really fully fooled and dumbledore was always suspicious of him and obviously dumbledore like he said says to harry he's like uh after going through the orphanage memory he's like harry's like did you know and dumbledore's like did you did i know he was going to be the most horrible powerful dark wizard in history no i didn't know he was just a kid a week later i knew <laughs> <laughs> and so tom for all of his efforts he never fooled dumbledore now i think the most interesting thing about voldemort is his inability to love and where that comes from yes. now as we've been talking about and i'm sure you all know born to Tom Marvolo Riddle, a muggle, and Marope Gaunt, a witch descended from Salazar Slytherin, part of the Gaunt family, who had pretty much her magical abilities were suppressed because of the abuse she suffered, the emotional abuse she suffered from her parent, from her father and her brother. Now, Marope, like Andy said, had a huge crush and was in love with Tom Riddle, the handsome muggle who lived down the, down the hill, the wealthy muggle. Now, Marope used a love potion to make Tom Riddle fall in love with her. And then they ran off together and got married and she got pregnant. And so she got pregnant while he was under the spell of a love potion. And then as we explained earlier, after she lifted the potion with the hopes that maybe he'll love me for who I am. We've been together, we're gonna have a child. Maybe he's actually really in love with me and I don't have to use this, this magic on him to make him love me. The potion was stopped spell was lifted and he ran away tom left her and then marobe died in childbirth and obviously we know that dumbledore cannot love basically he cannot love there's there's nothing he loves even though you know you can say the the thing he has the most feelings towards is hogwarts i don't think he's, he's i still don't think he loves hogwarts it's just the strongest emotional connection he has to anything is hogwarts yeah he, he's incapable of love but it's it's his home Yes, yeah, it's his yeah, home. It's his home. So that's how he views, just like Harry views Hogwarts as his home. It's a similarity, actually, that should be on that list. Already did. Oh, did you? Yeah, so, so they, I'm sorry. They both view Hogwarts as their home. Exactly, bro. So because Tom was born without love, he was born without a mother, he was born and made with his father under a love potion, you could argue that because of that, Voldemort has an incapability to feel love understand love or even have a curiosity towards love which is his greatest weakness of all and so we we learn um through that memory of him in dumbledore's office that he he basically uh teases dumbledore about his notion about love being the more more powerful than any magic that he's ex experimenting with and the thing is voldemort does not understand love is not like a spell love is not like a, a magical thing that you can create it's the it's what love does to people. How love uh, motivates people to make actions. How it motivates their the way they think and their perspective of things. That's what Dumbledore means by love being more powerful than magic. Because you know it's the love that these characters have for other characters that basically cause Voldemort's downfall. You know it's it's Lily's love for Harry that creates that sacrificial bond and protection. It's Snape's love for Lily that makes him turn on Voldemort. It's Narcissa's love for Draco that makes her lie to Voldemort. Uh, it's Harry's love uh, for his friends that makes him sacrifice himself to Voldemort. There's so many ways that love defeats Voldemort. It's a massive list and that's what Voldemort doesn't understand. It's not like a, a thing that you can like, it's not tangible. It's love is a feeling and it's it, people act on that feeling and it's their actions 
that were motivated by love, which caused his downfall. And even the Fidelius charm that where Harry yes. calls home, yeah. he's protected by love. Yeah. Which is incredible. Do not pity the Harry, the dead Harry. Pity, pity the, the living, living. And above all, those, those who, who live, live without, without love. love. <laughs> Great quote from Albus Dumbledore. <laughs> love is the answer. There's um an aspect to Voldemort that although uh, we've talked about his mistakes and his downfalls and things he's done and a made mistakes he's made, I say. Um, he is very wise in terms of his new rise to power. So in his old, in his old, his first in the during the first Wizard of War, his first rise to power, he was like, "I got my army. Let's take shit over. Let's kill people. Let's go nuts." But then you think that's how generals talk? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. In the second war, when he's rising to power, Tom Voldemort's working in the shadows. Voldemort's back, but he understood. And it's very smart. He understood that. If I can get control of the media and the government, the ministry, the ministry, then at, that's going to serve all of my needs. Nobody has to know that I'm really alive. And so once he does seize control of both the media and the government, the Ministry of Magic, um, and they're printing papers like um, Harry Potter, pu uh, Public Enemy Number One, Undesirable, Undesirable Number, number one. one, Pious, uh, Plus Thickness, Plus Thickness, Plus, plus Thickness, <laughs> plus thickness is, is uh, the Minister of Magic. Under uh, and he's loyal. He's actually under the uh, um, imperious, imperious curse. curse, and so when he, he gets control of the forces of power in the in the wizarding world, and also he doesn't reveal himself to the public. He never shows his face. People aren't even sure if he's really back or not. The newspapers are denying it. There's rumors floating about. There's a lot of fear, but nobody knows for sure if Voldemort is back, except for the few people who have seen him. So it's actually very smart of him to stay working in the shadows behind the scenes. And his rise to power because what's really great is the the Ministry of Magic in Deathly Hallows takes on a very Nazi-like regime. It has a lot of parallels to the Nazi party and fascism. And that was done in a similar way of a person rising to power, taking control of the media and the government and the military to seize control of the country. And so Voldemort did exactly the same thing. So it was very smart of him, his second rise to power. And because of the naivety of the Ministry of Magic before he even is... He starts taking it over. They're like a year behind because Cornelius Fudge, out yeah. of fear and out of not wanting to lose his position as as uh, Minister of Magic and have to face Voldemort, pretends, even though he knows deep down, he knows Voldemort's back. If Dumbledore's telling me he's back, I'm going to pretend like he's not back. I'm going to deny it forever until I actually see his face. Yeah. And so he, he, Voldemort f spends a year getting his strength built because the Ministry of Magic is so naive. It's more like he, Fudge doesn't want to accept it. Yeah. And he just keeps denying it. Not because he's um, not because he's like loyal to Voldemort or evil, because he just doesn't want it to be true. He's a politician. Anything. Yeah. He, he wants everything to be hunky-dory. Yeah, he wants to keep his job. <laughs> yeah, numbers are great this year. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... There are, there's the next thing I want to talk about is um, there are changes in the book and film, from the book to the film. A couple of them work, but then there's there are a few things that I, I, that I didn't really like, and then there are a couple of things that I did not like at all. Um, Please bring them up. So the first thing I didn't like was the final battle. Between Harry and Voldy? Between Harry and Voldy. And the book, it takes place within the Great Hall, and everybody is watching it. Um, Voldemort and Harry are circling each other and there's just like a body, a sea of bodies around them and everyone's just watching this. Harry runs great dialogue yeah, And too. Harry is just, is teasing Voldemort, revealing all these things that Voldemort is shocked that Harry knows about his past, about the Horcruxes, everything about Voldemort. And it's just this great moment for Harry of just like seizing power and watching Voldemort squirm in front of everyone. It's one of the best parts of all of the books. It's a wonderful moment and it could have been so great to see on screen. I'm not sure why they didn't film it that way, but in the movie, the battle takes place between just Harry and Voldemort, mostly isolated, and then the final duel takes place in the courtyard. Nobody's there. And the reason and the reason why it doesn't have the same impact is what, the best part about that in the book is everybody's everybody watches Voldemort die. They get that closure. Voldemort's killed all the loved ones and friends of all these people. Uh, he's tormented the world. And just for everyone to see Harry defeat Voldemort and to see this guy just die, collapse on the floor, it was just... Everybody needed to see that. It was um, cathartic for everyone. And then the, in the movie, nobody saw it. And also, like, his body dissolved. So, like, I mean, it doesn't have that definitive 
aspect of like everybody saw him die in the movie only Harry saw him die and then he just dissipated into dust and then also during the battle there's a moment there are a couple moments where I know they wanted to extend the sequence but like Voldemort is strapping him in these wrapping him up in these straps and like grabbing his throat and like I was like what is going on just kill him just kill him like why are you not uh trying to kill this dude right now he's like this is the battle to Let's end all battles this together yeah and so there are moments during that fight where i i love the i like i liked how they added in the chasing through hogwarts that sequence is cool where it folded up the stairs yeah, up the stairs and it's just like cat and mouse that's cool but then that sequence in the in the rafters it just didn't it didn't feel right and it's in slow motion and then Voldemort's just like uh hovering up to him with his straps wrapping around Harry tying him up it was very took me out of the moment yeah I felt the same way the first time I saw the movie obviously I was so grateful to get a great film in yeah. general and get these movies made we're so grateful to have that all is they're amazing I, I love them I love the is amazing too. yeah however I felt the same way and part of me can't help but maybe think it's um it was a marketing thing maybe for a better trailer for posters think of the posters for the harry potter deathly Hallows part two it's like voldemort and harry and their wands destruction and the behind empty, them the empty courtyard part of me makes it think like the production design and what the studio wanted for marketing purposes for trailer purposes maybe that's tied into it somehow it's the only thing i can think of of why not do it i mean scheduling with actors they're all there they're, they're all, all there. love to be ha- it's hard, part of it. were they all they weren't doing anything else Make, <laughs> like everyone's gonna see it so it's not like they're gonna lose money on yeah. it I, I maybe they I, didn't I think the, the great way. hall was epic enough in scale you could have just done it in the courtyard Maybe I'm I'm, get, I'm sure the filmmakers wanted to do it. I just can't help but think that it was a studio thing, a studio oversight on marketing, trailers, posters, all that goes into these three hundred million dollar movies. They're all those wheels are turning. Of what's the best way to market this? We need great images from the movie for posters. We need we need great images to make a cool trailer. Yeah. We need a little more action between. Can we get some more action in there between Harry and Voldemort? Maybe they wanted more dialogue. Can we have more yeah. battle sequences besides wands? Can we have like I guarantee it's studios like being like Warner Brothers like we need a little more, a little more action sequences between Voldemort and Harry for the trailer. For this scene, we need to fill in some more fluff between them during the Battle of Hogwarts while everything else is happening. Well, uh, um, Neville slices off Nagini's head. All that's going on at the same time with cross-cutting. So it works differently cinematically, but I still think that personally, some of the marketing probably tied into that. I think you have. I think you might have a point there with the way it looked visually, aesthetically. For maybe they, never, yeah. if you never read the books, it looks awesome. Because, but the thing is, like the the Great Hall, it just it felt right because when Harry walked in the Great Hall for the first time, it was so incredible of a moment for him. And to have Voldemort's end take place in the Great Hall seems so fitting. It seems small, though. Yeah, I think it may. Come maybe back. they thought it was just too small physically. Cinematically, I think it just works differently. But yeah, I just, I yeah. Still, still, they could have had everyone outside though. That would have been. Yeah, everyone could have. I and when I was watching, I was like, "Where is everyone?" And it was still a great moment. It was still awesome to see. I'm just saying, part it wasn't just being in the Great Hall, but it was just everyone spectating it. Because you know, if you love the books and you've read the books many times, like we have, you were waiting for Harry's speech to Dumbledore. Yeah, the speech never, yeah. They trickled it in here and there. He the goes off on Voldemort. But that's like yeah. a great couple pages. Yeah. Some of the best pages of the entire book yeah. series, like you said. When Harry takes control, it's it's great. And also, it, speaking of that battle, my other next change I didn't like was that Voldemort, in the book, he actually battles Horace um, Professor McGonagall, he b- battles Slughorn McGonagall and uh, Kingsley Shacklebolt all at the same time during the Great Great Hall battle, which is a great moment in the books. It's it's great to see the teachers involved and also showing how powerful they are if they're like holding their own against Voldemort. They're doing it together, obviously, yeah. but it they was also a, stand no chance against. Yeah, they st- him. yeah, I mean, he was overpowering them, but it was it was still it would have been cool to see them other people fighting Voldemort instead of just Harry. Mm-hmm. Also. Um, in the books, it's explained much more in detail about how the spell is put on Voldemort's name, where if anyone says Voldemort, um, it reveals the location. The taboo. The taboo. And that's not really explained at all in the books. Especially after I mean, the, in the wedding, movies, it's not how the Death Eaters find yeah. Harry, Ron, and Hermione at the cafe. That's how they, that's have, how they, they find yeah. them, but they don't explain that at all in the yeah. books. So it, there's, and there's another instance where Death Eaters find them, and it's never explained about the name. And that's something, I mean, it's just uh, maybe a couple lines of dialogue. Maybe they couldn't figure out a way to put it in. Uh, but that's something I was like, it would really help people understand how the Death Eaters even found them in that cafe. But again, maybe no one really questioned and That's it. also how they find them in the forest. Yeah, in the, the woods. Forest, yeah. But they do it differently in the in the movie. In, in the, the movie, movies. they just run into them. Yeah. Yeah. So they just like tiptoed around that and just like. 
the entirety of Dean's forest. Yeah, it's like oh, I found him. <laughs> yeah, that chase never happens in the books, but it looked cool though. It looked cool. But yeah. that's and and then also Sherlock Holmes, uh, yeah. Game of Shadows. I, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and then I also um I mentioned earlier Voldemort really being repulsed by being called Tom uh, in the books, but then not not really showing that disgust in the in the movies except for in Chamber when he's like my filthy mud blood name by my filthy muggle father. He says it then, but otherwise, and when other characters like Harry and Tom in Dumbledore call him Tom, he doesn't really have a reaction. That's another great part of the speech that Harry gives yeah. before they fight is he's constantly calling him Tom, and each yeah. time he says it, Voldemort gets more and more upset. Yeah, so that's something they didn't really show in the movies. He's like, yeah, your name is Tom, fool. Little bitch Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but a, a change I did like, what you mentioned earlier, I liked how they didn't go with the red eyes, and I liked how they didn't go with slits for eyes. I think going with the Ray Fiennes' natural eyes helped the audience connect to the to the character as a human being and not just like this monstrosity. So I think it was important uh, to have the blue eyes. Yeah, and they it was minimal in makeup really. Yeah. They just put some. They used the black dots for motion capture on his face, and then just CGI'd his nose out with the slits, and it wasn't a ton. Otherwise, the design of the character I thought was really excellent, mm -hmm. really really well done, really really excellent. So excellent. <laughs> so good. <laughs> <laughs> Any more uh, things you didn't like? That was it for things I didn't like. All right, let's talk about Voldemort and Dumbledore for a little bit. So Dumbledore was the professor at Hogwarts that that obviously went to greet Tom Riddle to tell him that he was a wizard and invite him to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry at the orphanage. Dumbledore was also the first and only professor at Hogwarts at the time to notice a dark side to Tom Riddle, which the Chamber of Secrets situation really put his eyes on Tom Riddle, especially. Eyes on the prize. He certainly kept an annoyingly, annoyingly close, close watch on me. Dumbledore was also the first wizard to not fear Voldemort, and possibly the only wizard to not fear Voldemort, which he passed on to Harry. Also to say his name. Yes, Voldemort also despised Dumbledore because Dumbledore's belief in the triumph of power of love was something that both confused and disgusted Voldemort. He rejected the notion of love. Voldemort is also thought to be the only person I mean Dumbledore is the only person thought to Dumbledore was thought to be the only person Voldemort ever feared and one of the few people Voldemort was unable to intimidate like the use of the word of the name Tom instead of Voldemort was a great way for Dumbledore to show Dumbledore to show he's not afraid of Voldemort, also to show that and to refuse the ability of Voldemort to dictate the terms of their relationship, so that he had no power over him. What's also interesting is throughout Harry's in child, entire childhood, from when he was a baby until he was um, accepted into Hogwarts, Dumbledore spent all that time trying to figure out what Voldemort, what happened to Voldemort, and because he knew Vol he knew Voldemort wasn't really dead. And so he spent a long time trying to figure out what exactly happened uh, and what where Voldemort was. And so just like you could say Quirrell, um, however, with completely different motivations, Dumbledore has always been working to figure out what's going on with Voldemort. And always behind the scenes. He was handling the the Marvalo ring um, during uh, or, uh, before Half-Blood Prince. And so he was always behind the scenes. Harry was kind of un unaware of how much work he was doing in trying to investigate uh, Voldemort. In Voldemort's final state, his his fate is being this broken and mangled piece of a soul forced to exist in the stunted form of a flayed and mutilated baby that Harry saw in King's Cross Station during his visit to Limbo, where he had the conversation with Dumbledore. And Voldemort's mangled piece of soul forever will remain there, unable to return to the land of the living, even as a ghost, and unable to move on to the afterlife because his soul was so maimed and corrupted from creating the Horcruxes. Got what you deserve. Jeez. Whew. Man, what a great character. So I think that kind yeah. of wraps everything I, up. I'm, I'm, I think I'm pretty solid with yeah. everything I, I want mean, to say. I mean, it's just such a great, ironic character. You know, he's both the creator and victim of his enemy. He attempted to kill Harry, but armed Harry with the ult with the ultimate weapons from his mother's sacrifice to defeat him. Misunderstanding of love. All of it is so fascinating. Such yeah. an interesting, well-written, well-formed character. If you've never read the books, really recommend checking them out because if just for Voldemort to learn more about him. Yeah. You learn so much more about him and the character. And I think if, I mean, they'll they'll eventually readapt the, the books. Uh, hopefully not. Um, but if they do, I hope they dive more into Voldemort's character. Hopefully. Because if you really know 
Um, and if you know his character well and how in depth it is in the books to the layers of him, it makes him an even better villain than people think he is. All right, I think that wraps our episode. Great job, on Voldemort. We're I guess we're calling this the analyzing, analyzing evil. evil. Those are the, the evil. best words to use, I think. Yeah. Uh, really fun. I can't wait to do this with another character from another movie. That'll be a blast. This but is my favorite episode we've done in a while. Yeah, me honestly. too. And it's so fun. This is also the last episode we're recording inside of our old studio. Goodbye set. We are building a brand new set. It will be the next time you see a new episode, it will be on the new set, which is going to be sick. There's actually going to be space behind us. It's going to be really <laughs> cool. It's going to be larger. We're in the middle of construction of it right now. We got some great stuff getting built. So if you're new to the show and you're checking this episode out and it's already been posted for a while go check out the new set all right take care y'all hope you enjoyed this episode have uh, a good night what a cadaver oh harry i'd almost forgotten you were here <laughs> i can touch you oh! <laughs> this episode of raiders of the lost podcast has been executive produced through patreon by cody moen john a graz calvin cam Lauren Smertz, Tyler McFly, and Luke Eccleston. Thank you so much for supporting our show, everyone. Raiders of the Lost Podcast is a Mirror Image production. Sound mixing done by Jacob Kosler. Opening music by Chase Jackson.